Well, after a political truce of sorts in the aftermath of the tragedy, the federal government and the opposition have begun trading blows over asylum seeker policy. The opposition claims the horror might have been avoided under a tougher regime. The federal government disputes this. And in the mix, independent Andrew Wilkie claims the opposition offered to double its humanitarian intake during negotiations to form minority government. Well, I'm joined now by opposition immigration spokesman Scott Morrison. Good morning, Heather. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. <laughs> Did you make that offer to Andrew Wilkie to double the humanitarian intake? No. Um, what we had at the last election was a policy to marginally increase the refugee and humanitarian intake as part of a private sponsorship pilot based on what was done in the Canadian experience, which we thought was worthwhile pursuing. So that was, that was our policy at the last election. We also said that we would, take, we would increase the mandated UNHCR refugee component from within the overall cap because we believed our policies and still do believe our policies would reduce the number of illegal boat arrivals and that would free up more space in the program for those mandated refugees from camps. Are you suggesting that Andrew Wilkie invented this or what? I'm not suggesting anything. I'm just telling you what we understood uh, took place during those discussions and, and uh, that was our policy at the election. So there's nothing surprising about the fact that we said we were planning to take more, but uh, the, the, the suggestion of doubling, no. So why would he say something like this? You'd have to ask him. Well, moving on, on the Christmas Island accident... It, you were left it a few days before the gloves came off, but now they're well and truly off. Is this the right time to be using the tragedy for political and policy discussion? Well, as I said on the day of the incident and the days that followed, that certainly wasn't the time. I mean, the, the nation was shocked. I was shocked. Um, this, this was, as I said at the time, my worst fears realised, and I, I don't know what worse fear there could be than those scenes that we saw that morning. Um, but at at an appropriate time, and I believe we're now in that phase, it, we, we cannot allow uh, the policy to go unchanged, in our view. I mean, there, there must be a change of policy. We've advocated that for a long period of time. We've had these views for 10 years, and we've been attacked for them. We've been called everything from racist to in, inhuman um, in terms of our views. But I do know that over six years, when we had our policy measures in place, there were just 10 boats and less than 250 people arrived. That's, that's, that happens in half a month these days. But does that take account of various push factors? Is that a distortion of the figures? No. Because you've had various events in Afghanistan, in Sri Lanka and so on? There's always been push factors. There's been push factors for decades and decades. In fact, the, the number of uh, asylum applications made in industrialised country back in 99 to 2001 was over, got up to over 600,000. It's in its 300,000s today. But there will always be an, an insatiable demand for people to come and do this. Uh, what changes is, is the, the policy environment in which people smugglers operate. And in the last two and a half years, uh, they've had a much more conducive environment. Is the political reality here that no side really has the answers here to stop the boats? There is no simplistic and quick solution. Well, there's no simplistic solution, but there are solutions. And as I said before, when we had our regime of policies in place, only 10 boats in, in six years. Now, that's, that's, that's the evidence of our policy. It's not a slogan. It's, it's what actually happened. Now, those measures we've put again, and we've added new measures to those. And I think it's a question of resolve as well. You keep going until they stop. I noticed that you're now turned back to the turn back the boat slogan of the election campaign when in a couple of weeks ago Tony Abbott appeared to have dropped this, uh, referring instead to, to stronger borders. Is this really a deliberate shift in strategy to make use of, of what's happened on Christmas Island? No, I reject that, absolutely. I think that's an outrageous thing to suggest. Um, it's been our policy to stop the boats. That's what we did when we were in government. That's what we'd like to do again. Now, no, no amount of, of, of consensus and bipartisanship is more important than that objective. And uh, we're committed to that. I said today in a statement, I'm happy to work with the government, as Tony Abbott said yesterday, to, to work together to implement our policies. But it's the policies that are important and the government needs to implement those in our view. Are you prepared to try and work together with the government on this to avoid polarising the community, which we've seen going on for several years now? Well, there's a difference of view about policy. And as long as that is the case, 
well, it's hard to actually have the same view. And, and our view is that you need strong measures now, not weaker measures. The government has already weakened measures uh, on the advocacy of many uh, within their own ranks, of other parties and of others are involved. Now, I don't believe that weaker policies are the answer here. And uh, it's a time for people to make decisions and act. It's not a time for committees. It's a time for decisions. You're talking, for example, about a return to use of temporary protection visas, which actually divided members within your own party. Is it worth the pain and the division that this does create in the electorate? It's worth stopping the boats, Heather. I think that's, that's, that's the Do you key. have any it's evidence worth... that that does stop the boats? Well, I've just said on a number of occasions, six years those policies were in place and we went from 43 boats in 2001 and 5,500 people and in 2002 not one boat. Not one boat. And it wasn't just the policy measures, it was the resolve of the government and the Prime Minister in particular at the time. And this Prime Minister faces a similar test. Kevin Rudd failed the test with the Oceanic Viking. This Prime Minister now faces her test. And I can, I can assure you that Tony Abbott and I and the team would be, would be prepared to do what is necessary to do this. At a recent speech, I think, that you made to the Lowy Institute here in Sydney, you talked of the need for regional protection processes, which is the same track that the government is on. Mm. Have you shifted ground in that area? No, the point I was making is that they've got the wrong region. The region which asylum seekers are coming from is Central Asia. The countries of first asylum in Pakistan and Iran, where there is 1.7 million Afghans living in just less than 100 camps, that's where the support for camps is needed. That's where processing centres already in some form exist. And what we need to do is stop people moving beyond the countries of first asylum, because with this process, we help a few and we ignore the many. And uh, it's the many that I think we should be trying to help, uh, those in the camps. Why is Nauru, a processing centre on Nauru, your insisted solution to this issue when the government is, is arguing that East Timor is the solution? Is this basically an argument over semantics? No, because... That you are kind of on the same track there? Well, no, they're, they're two different types of centres, I should be clear about that. But firstly, Nauru will happen. Nauru could happen within a matter of weeks, uh, four well, to six weeks. Well, the government weeks. again disputes this. Well, they, they, they haven't been there. I've been there. I've spoken to the government and the opposition. I've worked through a number of the issues with them. When the government, I said today, if Chris Bowen would like to get on a plane and come to Nauru with me, I'm happy to have the same discussions again and demonstrate a bipartisan commitment to getting that centre open. The same with Manus Island and PNG. What we're proposing can actually happen. East Timor is a never-never solution. But it doesn't fall under the United Nations conventions that the government is insisting upon. Mm. And also the government would argue that under that process, 90% of those who went through ended up in, in New Zealand and Australia anyway. Well, on that argument, then East Timor is a waste of time as well. But the other point I'd make is this, is the principle of non-refoulement, which is the core principle of the convention. That is now an established principle of international law. That is something that applies equally in Nauru as it would in East Timor or any, Indonesia or any other part of the world. So from my point of view, that's an excuse from the government not to take up an option that can exist. But let's say Papua New Guinea is similarly an option. Why they're insisting on East Timor is beyond me. And this is a regional processing centre. So anyone who crosses some imaginary line to come into the region will get processed at this centre. So it's going to draw even more people into the region, uh, which is, we see as a flaw in the policy design. Do you intend to play this issue in the same way through next year? Can you see it continuing to be a major part of the debate? I will campaign for stronger border protection until we have it. Uh, that's what we've been doing for 10 years. When we're in government, we had it. This government rolled it back and we've argued consistently that it should be restored. Uh, so whether there's uh, an election coming or not an election coming is not the issue. The problem that at the moment we're seeing and continue to see is the boats keep coming. As long as they keep coming, we will advocate these policies. Scott Morrison, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Thanks, Emma.